apologies about that. Um, now I can go back to showing you the slides. Um, again, my name is Amy Ranger, Director of Programs at the California School Based Health Alliance, and today's webinar is a youth vaping epidemic update, and we're really pleased to be having this webinar today. Um, even though it's a distressing subject, it's really important that we are all as school health providers and advocates talking about this. And um, again, a big thank you to Anthem Blue Cross. This is part of a five-part series. This is number three, and we have two more coming up, one in February and one in March, and you can register for those on our website. Um, so. Um, we really appreciate Anthem's um, partnership in bringing these topics to the school health communities in California. So I'm going to go ahead and start us off. Um, the goals of today's webinar are to um, identify vaping devices and their ingredients, um, to um, talk about how to communicate the risks of vaping with students and parents, and to access curricula and resources to share with school communities. So Stephen is going to be walking us through all of those. Uh, technology. There we go. Um, a quick business. Um, uh, presumably if you hear this, then you've already figured this out, but um, in case people are watching and not able to see, the way to get into the audio um, is either through your computer or often a better reception is to dial in to the number 415-655-0003, and then there's the access code on the screen. It's 669-237-587. So that's a way to listen. You can also listen without watching, but of course, Stephen has prepared lots of visual sites for us also. I um, we are recording this webinar, so in case you want to um, have colleagues listen to it or go back and listen to it again or can't stay on, um, it will be on our website in the next couple of days, both the slides and the recording. Um, and we will share all supporting materials, so we'll send out um, the resources that Stephen's going to walk us through and any other um, materials that come up today or that we have on this topic, we'll send out to the attendee list and post on our website. Um, so a really big thank you to Stephen Lambert. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he's the Prevention Coordinator at the Orange County Department of Ed. Um, he has 12 years of experience in substance use prevention, youth development, family and community engagement, and developmental asset building. Um, in his role at the Orange County Department of Education, he supports schools and districts with training and technical assistance around alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention. And we have had him speak at other um, conferences and events um, to really well reception and acclaim, so that's why we asked him to come back again today and talk specifically around vaping. Um, hopefully all of you are familiar with us, and that's how um, you found this webinar, but just a quick review. The California School-Based Health Alliance is a statewide nonprofit. Um, we support school-based health centers and the launching of new school-based health centers across California. Um, we also support schools in their school health programming. Um, we do this through an annual conference that I'll talk about in one second, as well as training opportunities like today's webinar. We have a very robust website at school health centers and lots of opportunities for schools and school-based health centers to get involved as part of a bigger community of learning. So definitely reach out to us um, if you have questions, if you have ideas, um, if you have other topics that you want to see. We definitely want to be meeting the needs of um, school health advocates across California. Um, one way to be part of our team is to be a member. Um, it's a relatively small membership fee annually, and it gets access to additional um, tools and resources, plus some member-only webinars. We have one coming up on February 5th around policy, the state policy platform for the year, um, and that's a members-only webinar. Um, it also allows a discount for re registration, conference registration. Um, which is coming up soon. So we're launching registration this week. Um, the early bird discount will be in effect through the end of March, and the conference itself is May 14th and 15th. It will be in Sacramento. Um, there will be an advocacy day on the Thursday the 14th with visits to legislators, and then pre-conference sessions in the afternoon, as well as a reception in the evening, and then a full conference day on Friday, May 15th. So check out our website for more information about that. And with that, we are going to move into our content for today. So give me one second to switch over facilitation to Stephen, and then we will hear. Okay, Stephen, you should have the clicker. Yes. Uh, can everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right, I'm going to start screen sharing. Hopefully everybody can see now. 
Uh, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this webinar. And I'm hoping that the information that we go through today is really gonna help you um, in your work with students, families, communities uh, that were providing the same level of, of accurate information um, about vaping. Because a lot of folks out there, I'm sure you've encountered this, have really different ideas about what vaping is, whether it's harmful or not, is it a cessation tool? So I'm hoping we can jump into some of these conversations here today and answer all of your questions. But let's jump right in. So a few of the topics that we're gonna be talking about today, starting with a, a game that I call, Is That a Vape? Where we're gonna look at the devices themselves, then jump in and talk about what the risks are according to the latest research. Talk a little bit about eValley and what's going on public health wise with e-cigarette use and vaping um, at kind of the state and national level. Talk about uh, the businesses behind some of these products and then finish by talking about some resources that you can then use in your practice, in your school-based health centers and uh, with students and families. So let's start with what is vaping. Just a really quick definition here. Uh, so we're all on the same page. So when you're smoking cigarettes, everybody knows how that works. You burn the tobacco and then the smoke that's released delivers the nicotine and a lot of the other toxic chemicals into the blood through your lungs, right? Well, with vaping, uh, I just wanna be clear about the process here. Nothing is getting burnt. So instead you have what's called an e-liquid. So electronic is the E in that. Uh, and that's being heated up by a heating element that's usually battery powered, sometimes rechargeable. And what that heating element is doing is turning that liquid into an aerosol. So you see that I'm not using the word um, vapor because aerosol is a more accurate way to describe it. There are these different particles and gases and chemicals contained within the aerosol. So it's not just water vapor as some people believe. So now we're gonna play, is that a vape? Uh, so the the traditional styles of e-cigarettes or vaping devices, uh, these are sort of the main categories here. Over on the left, you have the Sigalikes, which are so named because they resemble cigarettes, kind of the oldest generation. The idea being folks who are trying to quit smoking with these things would want something that looks and feels like a cigarette. So sometimes they would be have these cartridges that contain the liquid and then you would just empty once they're empty you replace them others disposable uh, but really not that popular amongst the youth with some exceptions now in the middle are the vape pens that was sort of the second generation of devices and uh, instead of having the cartridge or being disposable you would refill that tank up at the top uh, with your liquid and then over on the right are the tanks and the mods which are sort of the lexus of e-cigarettes so those can be $50, $60, sometimes two, $300 or beyond, um, all kinds of features. Some of them Bluetooth, link up with your phone, play your music, et cetera. Some of them have voice control. Um, but really the only key concept to know about tanks and mods is that you can really turn up the heat. So those are the ones that have the biggest batteries and you turn up the heat and get a very thick cloud. So if you're ever driving down the street and you look over at the car next to you and they've got the fog machine from Pirates of the Caribbean going on in there, Typically, they're using one of these devices and turning the heat way up. And we'll talk a little bit about the reasons for that and some of the drawbacks health-wise later on. However, uh, really what we're going to be focusing in on is the current generation of vaping devices. And so I wanted to provide some clarity for you on what is the state of vaping as it stands now. Um, and so there are really two main categories uh, to be knowledgeable about. So nicotine salt vaping and cannabis vaping. So let me explain what I'm talking about here. Nicotine, um, again, the chemical uh, of concern with tobacco products, um, the old style e-liquids, once you hit a certain level of nicotine concentration would become very uncomfortable and unpleasant to use. And so what the Juul company did is formulate a new form of liquid using what is called nicotine salt. So a salt form of nicotine along with benzoic acid. And what they were able to do there is cram a lot more nicotine into very little amount of liquid while still not having an unpleasant, extremely harsh experience. So now what has happened is all of the other folks in this industry have followed suit. And so they're all moving away from the old style, what's called free base nicotine liquids into nicotine salt. So you hear things like Nick Salt, Salt Nick, all these sorts of um, cute names for it. This is what we're talking about. So the three main types of uh, nicotine salt uh, devices that I wanna be going over with you are things like the Juul. So these are pod-based, so you may hear that a lot. 
Um, what we're referring to is this pod up here, in this case, the Joule, the most popular e-cigarette in the country. Uh, and this pod contains the heating element and the liquid itself. So, so I call it the K-cup of vapes because once this is empty, then you replace it with another pod. This is what really uh, took the industry by storm. In the middle, however, are the refillable and nicotine salt vapes. Even And this right here is the pod for the Soren drop. So instead of being replaceable, you refill the pod with liquid. Um, so you would refill it with your own nicotine salt liquid. This is the Soren drop. This is the most popular one in our area. I'm sure it varies throughout the state. There are numerous other devices. I'll show you some more photos later. Um, but the trend is actually toward these two categories. So the refillables and then finally, the disposables, which have really taken off, I would say, in the last three to six months. And so remember, I was talking about the Sigalike disposables earlier. Well, these are using the new nicotine salt liquid uh, and look very much like a stick of gum or uh, essentially a disposable jewel. So this holds about two jewel pods worth of liquid in here, and they can be had for about five or six dollars. You, if you have not seen these puff bars or um, other similar products, you will. Over on the right, these are the cannabis vaping uh, devices. So the Stizzy is another, it looks very similar to the Jewel, right? So there are flash drive style um, cannabis vaping devices. The Stizzy is the most popular in our area. It may vary, but they are an industry standard. Um, and they contain, the pods contain cannabis concentrate instead of nicotine. And then over on the right are the carts. So cartridges that are preloaded with the cannabis concentrate oil. Um, these you've seen a lot in the news lately, especially when we talk about E-Valley, which we'll return to later. So briefly for you, I want to run down the ingredients in E-Liquid because it is important when we start talking about the health consequences, all of the different ingredients have implications uh, for the health risks. So number one, of course, nicotine, uh, and we'll talk about that later, artificial flavors, and then finally propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. So you'll hear me say PG, VG. Those are just abbreviations for these two chemicals. And essentially what they are is they form kind of the liquid base. So the clear goopy liquid that forms the base of the e-liquid is made of those two chemicals. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. And I wanted to clarify what I mean by cannabis concentrates. So in uh, the stizzies or in the carts, typically you see a very high concentration of THC. Um, as you can see, this is uh, charting out the potency level. So the average in the 90s was about 4% for plant marijuana. Average in 2014 is 12%. I will add that the dispensaries tend to run in the 20 to 30% range. Um, and then down below, those are that's just an example of the stizzy that I showed you earlier. Um, lab tested at 82% THC. Unfortunately, there is not any long-term data on what the effects are of especially young people using 82% THC products. So we just kind of have to extrapolate from what we already know about the effects of marijuana on the developing brain, et cetera. But there are some specific concerns that we have about cannabis vaping that we'll return to later on. So let's talk about the risks. What, what are the concerns about vaping? Why should we, uh, why should we be discussing this? What, are, what is research telling us that we need to know? So first, we're going to talk about nicotine. You've probably seen this campaign, and this is from uh, California Department of Public Health. It's kind of an aggressive one, um, admittedly. So I wanted to dive in here and think, you know, what, is, what does this mean that nicotine equals brain poison? And does this message fall on the ears of young people? So when we're talking about nicotine being brain poison, what we're talking about is the way that nicotine can affect brain development for young people. Now, unlike adults, uh, teen brains are very sensitive to the effects of nicotine, uh, particularly in the regions affecting learning, memory, and attention can be very disruptive and lead to addiction. Now, that second part there, um, I wanted to emphasize quickly, since they're all working in health-based uh, environments, the stress relief component. So many students will say, oh, I vape or I smoke because I need to relieve my stress. It helps me relieve my anxiety. And it's important for young people to understand that there is research finding that when you expose a stress condition adolescent brain to nicotine, what that does is actually make the nicotine more addictive and rewarding and then potentially worsen those effects on brain development. 
So it's so important that we are teaching young people positive coping strategies and emphasizing, hey, you know, nicotine is not a suitable replacement for all of these positive coping strategies because you're sort of digging yourself into a deeper hole. Now, the second uh, bullet down below is talking about, uh, you may have seen that young people who vape uh, longitudinal studies have found our meta-analysis of longitudinal studies, found they're about three to four times as likely uh, to report smoking cigarettes at follow-up one year later. So that is worrying because I'm sure when your conversations with students about cigarettes look very different than your conversations with them about vaping, uh, most young people understand the risks of cigarette smoking, and that's why cigarette smoking among teens is very low. We don't want to see that creep back up because of the influence of vaping. So this is a statistic that um, has become more well known, so it probably can't fool any of you, but how much nicotine is in one of those jewel pods? So in case you had not heard the statistic, it is more than an entire pack of cigarettes. To be exact, there's about 41 milligrams of nicotine in a jewel pod uh, in 0 0.7 milliliters. And cigarettes typically deliver uh, one milligram per cigarette. So uh, the folks over at Stanford actually like to say it's closer to two packs of cigarettes if, if their bio, you know, bioavailability is correct. So not, needless to say, there is a lot of nicotine. The new nicotine salt liquids contain a, an extremely high level of nicotine. But beyond that, beyond nicotine, what about the other risks? So this is an infographic from the CDC showing some of the different chemicals that have been found in the e-cigarette aerosol. So just to list some of them off there, volatile organic compounds, cancer-causing chemicals, ultrafine particles, heavy metals, um, and flavorings known to be harmful, which we're going to touch on later. Uh, so then the question arises, you know, why, how are all of these things getting in here? And I thought this was just water vapor. Why are we seeing uh, these sorts of compounds? So as an explanation, I think it's important that we know the mechanism because students may not understand um, that what you put into a vape isn't what you get out of it. And that's very important for us to know what is happening. So PG, VG, and all the artificial flavorings, strawberry, cinnamon, uh, they're very safe at room temperature. Um, I mean, they use PG and VG in medicines, in um, cosmetics, foods. So it's not that these chemicals are harmful. It's the fact that when they're put into this device and heated, they change, they break down chemically. So over on the right, you see that uh, formaldehyde uh, graphic that's from our vaping prevention site, Not So Safe. Um, and you may have heard before that e cigarette aerosol contains formaldehyde, you know, the chemical used to preserve bodies. And if you were to just say that out of context to a young person, they might argue, well, wait, no, I mix my own e liquid, I put PG in there and organic flavoring, I don't put any of that formaldehyde in there. But here's the thing is that propylene glycol, when it is heated, one of the chemicals that it starts to break down into is formaldehyde. So it's just hydrogen and oxygen reforming the bonds and becoming formaldehyde. And the higher that you turn the heat, the more of that conversion happens. Now, this is important because remember we were talking about cranking up the heat on vapes to blow the big thick clouds and do these competitions, et cetera. So when you turn it up like that, or when you drip, which is when you take the tank off and just drip a few drops of the e-liquid onto the coil and into the wick, um, you get very thick clouds, but you have a lot more of this conversion happening. Another trend to be aware of is hitting a blinker is what it's called, or essentially you're vaping, you're puffing on the vape until it overheats and the light starts blinking and it's shutting down, um, sort of a competition on social media. And again, at whenever you are overheating the coil, more of that conversion is happening and that is especially harmful. Now, uh, the second part there is the heating coil. So the heating coil, uh, that metal part that's heating up the liquid, researchers have actually found that bits, uh, very, very tiny particles of the metals are actually leaching into the liquid and then into the aerosol. So that is why uh, in a lot of research, they find that the aerosol actually has comparable levels of metals, sometimes higher than cigarette smoke, which is surprising because cigarette smoke is so incredibly toxic. Um, so again, really the key concept here is that what goes in is not what comes out and what's safe to eat isn't what's safe to breathe. So kind of on, I, I want to delve back into the flavors a bit. We had talked about um, those artificial flavorings releasing toxic chemicals when heated. Now, 
how many of those flavors do you think researchers found when they were looking around on the internet in 2017? How many different flavors do you think that they found? Just put your guess in your head. And so if you said 15,586, you are correct. Uh, and this number is obviously outdated because that was, well, now three years ago. Um, and I don't point this out to say, wow, what a great flourishing market we have for vaping products, but rather to think about all of the different combinations. So when we're thinking, if these artificial flavorings, when they're heated up, are converting into toxic chemicals, now we have 15,000 different combinations of them, it's very difficult to say with confidence, yes, you know what you're vaping, you know what you're breathing when you turn one of these things on. It's just not plausible. Uh, and so unfortunately, these flavors are continuing uh, to multiply. So this is, I, I, I touched a little bit about this earlier, what's in the aerosol and exposure to it. So I wanted to talk about passive vaping because a lot of folks ask, is, is secondhand smoking, you know, is there secondhand vaping? And the answer is ultimately yes. So researchers have found nicotine from aldehyde aluminum, all of the other things that you find in the mainstream aerosol in the side stream aerosol. Um, and then the general guidance is that children, pregnant women, and people with health conditions should limit how much of exposure they have to secondhand aerosol because uh, these chemicals are present, including nicotine, and they can be metabolized into the body. Now, granted, these, these levels are generally lower than secondhand smoking. There's all kinds of variables here, inside, outside, et cetera. Nonetheless, it's important to understand that it is not, you're not just being exposed to water vapor as some people believe. So definitely stay away from those enclosed spaces. So typically what I'll do here is uh, have participants brainstorm, you know, what would you say if you're in a conversation with a student and you're talking about vaping, but they are convinced that it's just water vapor, there's just no big deal, it's flavored water. So briefly just take a moment and think about what would your key points be? What would your key ideas be that you would communicate with a student when you're trying to get across to them uh, no, it's not just water vapor. What what would your conversation points be? So take just a couple seconds and think about that. So everybody has different ways of relating to students. Everyone has different levels of rapport with individual students. And so there's gonna be a lot of variation in how you navigate that conversation. But I did wanna give some ideas here in case you were wondering, you know, what are some effective ways of communicating this with students? So number one, honing in on nicotine in the brain. I like to use a process of inquiry and ask students, why, why do you think the age for this stuff is 21? Why do you think that is? Um, since 2016, it's the age of 21. Why, why did we do that? Is this arbitrary? Do we just pick a random number? And then start them thinking to understand that the age of onset matters as far as the effects of different substances on the brain, which is why we put the age um, higher so that we can limit their exposure when they're younger. And then you can talk about what nicotine does to the developing brain. Second is talking about the different chemicals and metals, explaining that, hey, you know, it may seem like it's just water vapor and you may not taste anything that tastes bad, but in reality, all of these flavorings and the liquid itself is turning into toxic chemicals when it's heated, things that are not helpful or good to inhale. Although some of these levels may be lower than cigarette smoke, it is not uh, absent. So the last part there is safer isn't safe. And this is language that a lot of folks are using out there to describe vaping. Um, and the idea here is that when look at comparing smoking to vaping, right? When you're you're smoking, you're inhaling tons and tons of poisons and toxins because cigarette smoke is just that potent. But if I were to hand you a glass of rat poison and say, drink this, and you say, no, I don't want to drink that. And I hand you another glass and say, well, there's less rat poison in this one. You still want to drink it. Logically, you would take the third glass, you know, the flask of water or something, uh, you wouldn't drink the less poison because it's important for students to understand just because something has less poison in it doesn't mean that it's harmless, especially at their age. They're trying to navigate this conversation um, and thought process in a time when the overarching narrative on vaping is it's safer. That is the sort of the brand message. So we need to reframe that. 
So let's talk a bit about Evali. So e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury, thank you to the federal government for a great acronym. Uh, this is referring to those pulmonary illnesses that we're seeing across the country, including here in California, um, unfortunately resulting in a number of hospitalizations and some deaths. So let's talk about it. What is this? Uh, this is the list of symptoms. And as you read through this, it sounds very vague, doesn't it? This could be uh, a million different things happening health-wise. And the only commonality uh, that they're able to diagnose this is that there's no other explanation. That's really it. The, the only possible cause uh, identified in the patients was that they had been vaping. There was no infection, no other sort of illness. Um, so it's important that uh, the public health organizations are urging that anyone who is currently an e-cigarette or vape user, if they start to develop these symptoms, they seek help immediately because they could be uh, in the midst of developing this. Uh, this was the, the last time I updated it. We were up to about 2,500 cases nationwide with about 54 deaths. Uh, and as you can see on the map here, they're sort of distributed throughout the country, right? And so you'll notice, um, especially in our conversations around this illness being centered on marijuana vaping, interestingly, you'll see states that are not particularly progressive on marijuana policy still having quite a number of these cases. Um, and it's really all over the place. It's difficult to pin down you know, what the epidemiology of this and what what are the root causes? Um, now, I because so many of these cases have been linked to marijuana cannabis vaping, I wanted to just include some links here of examples of why vaping marijuana has some specific risks not common to the other forms of marijuana. So uh, with legal states and medical marijuana, a lot has changed on marijuana, marijuana regulation. But um, unfortunately, it's not a perfect system. And so you can see these are just some examples of uh, tainted products. And this does include actually other forms of marijuana. So when folks go in, investigators go into dispensaries and they buy a product, sometimes when they go and have them tested by neutral third parties, they will find um, banned pesticides, heavy metals, things that should not be in a substance that you're inhaling. Uh, and so really, we don't have this perfect system and there's not uh, a guaranteed level of cleanliness to these products. To add to that, we have counterfeit and gray market products. So the counterfeits, um, what is happening is people are able to buy up these, particularly the cartridges in bulk, fill them with their own liquid. And then what they're doing is making counterfeit packaging. It looks very slick and very convincing. Uh, and when you purchase these products, you think that you're getting a product that is clean, that is tested and regulated, but unfortunately is not. Um, and it's very difficult to tell what is counterfeit and what is not. And when we're talking about students, when they're sourcing these things socially and getting them from, you know, buying it in the restroom at the high school, they have no idea where it came from. So if it looks like it's in a clean professional package, it very much has that illusion um, of safety and cleanliness. So the uh, the lung damage itself. So the Mayo Clinic, they did some biopsies um, and with 17 of the cases and looked at the tissues and found it looks somewhat like they had been exposed to like a toxic gas. It looked like chemical burns um, in the tissue. Uh, and so it was interesting to see not, uh, not what was thought to be lipoid pneumonia, um, meaning that they're inhaling the oils was having some sort of effect. It was really difficult for them to say, you know, what is, what is causing this? What are the chemicals that are causing this? And so it's sort of an enigma still. Uh, and on October 4th, uh, the FDA put out a press release. And when you get these slides, you'll be able to click anything that's underlined and you can go straight to this. Um, but anyways, they had released this press release saying, if you're vaping THC cannabis concentrates, just stop, please, because we don't, we can't say it's just the black market. It's just the counterfeits. You may have bought it at a retail store. It is unclear what is causing this. Now on November 8, uh, they put out another <laughs> item talking about the vitamin E acetate. So this is an additive, which came up very early on in this outbreak, which um, some folks, I believe up in, uh, in the East Coast or the Midwest said, hey, we found a lot of this vitamin E acetate in some of the cartridges that we've tested uh, for these patients who have had this illness. Could this be it? 
Unfortunately, that wasn't the case for a lot of the other cartridges and um, vaping products that were coming up in other states. So the CDC FDA said, well, maybe it's not that. But on November 8th, they said, we tested a whole bunch of lung fluid from different patients and found a lot of them had this vitamin E acetate in there. So to briefly explain, a vitamin E acetate is just another example of something that's completely safe at room temperature, completely safe in other products, but not at all safe to inhale. So what is they're doing is adding this in to the cartridges as a thickener so that it appears that there is more of this liquid um, in these counterfeit and gray market cartridges. But in fact, it is not and very, very dangerous, very harmful to the lung tissue. So I just wanted to point out here, you see this packaging right here. It looks very clean, very professional. Dank Vapes in particular is one of those brands that they found to have a lot of counterfeits and fakes um, and really is almost a fake brand. So you, but you wouldn't know it just looking at it. It looks very, very clean, very professional. So the CDC did issue some recommendations here uh, for those who are vaping currently. And again, if you click this, it'll take you to uh, the web page. So not buying stuff on the street, don't modify, don't add anything to the liquids. If you're using these to quit smoking, don't switch back to cigarettes. Use approved cessation supports and seek medical attention if the symptoms show up, although they're very vague, as I mentioned earlier, which makes it difficult. So this is... Um, uh, a discussion that you'll un, uh, you're very likely to to have with students when talking about anything related to marijuana, but particularly this this outbreak. Um, students may be under the impression, "Hey, it's legal. Why? You know, it's legal. It's medicine. It's helpful. Uh, why are we concerned about this?" And after all, uh, for example, cigarettes cigarette smoking kills over four hundred thousand Americans each year, predominantly from heart disease, but also cancers and other illnesses. Why should we be concerned about marijuana vaping in particular? And so uh, I just wanted to provide you with some some guidelines on talking points, ways that you could navigate this conversation. So first, very similarly to the way that we talk about nicotine, also talking about THC and what that does to the brain, why we set the age at 21 for this. Yes, it's legal, but not for high school students. Why do you think that is? Um, and get them to think about brain development and what happens when you put any substance into the brain at an early age. Second is that medicine has side effects, right? We look at the opioid crisis that we're immersed in right now, and it's very easy to see that something that can be extremely helpful and therapeutic for someone or even have medicinal value, right, maybe, um, for others can be very harmful if abused, if it becomes addictive, if it's not used with a physician's supervision, right? So we could acknowledge that just because something may help someone medically doesn't mean that it's a clean slate and not harmful to anyone. Um, and third is it's happening very, very quickly. So the illnesses from cigarette smoking, let's say, tend to take decades uh, to take root. So just as an example, my father smoked for about 40 years um, he started when he was 15 years old, smoked for 40 years, and his cancer didn't show up until 10 years after he had quit, right? So it takes a very long time for some of these things to develop, whereas for this illness, it's taking place in less than a year in many cases. And that's very concerning, which leads us then to number four, which is we don't actually know what the long-term effects are. I'm hoping that we're not going to see some surge in a new sort of respiratory disease 10 or 20 years from now. I hope that that's the case. We're not going to see that. But ultimately, it's unknown. Um, and then number five, we can walk and chew gum, right? Yes, the opioid crisis is taking a lot of lives. Yes, a lot of people die from smoking-related diseases. But just because we have one public health pro uh, problem doesn't mean we can't tackle another. And so it's important we don't, um, we don't diffuse our energy um, and not focus on something that's very urgent as well. Briefly, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the businesses here, uh, the, the industry side, because this is particularly relevant in working with students and is something that the industry does not like um, when it comes to prevention programs is pointing out uh, the capitalism and <laughs> some of the, uh, the practices, business practices of the tobacco industry. So uh, many of you probably know this already, but um, the Juul company, again, controlling the majority of the e-cigarette stake in the country, uh, back in December of last year, not this past December, the year prior, Altria uh, bought 35% of the company for about 12.8 billion. 
Uh, and so they're the makers of Marlboro, right? They're the parent of Philip Morris. And they then quickly installed their own CEO, a former Altria guy. They kicked out the CEO of Juul, put in their guy, kicked out the CFO, put in their guy. And they've just been kind of filling the company with tobacco executives, which doesn't spell good things for a company that claimed it wasn't big tobacco. You may have seen uh, last year, Juul came under fire. They're kind of an easy target because they're so prominent. They're sort of the Kleenex of vapes. And so they got called before Congress, actually, because there was so much um, damage control to be done around vaping and what is happening. So again, if you click this in the slides, you'll be able to go to the video or the article. Uh, and as part of the testimony, some students came forward and were talking about what happened when Juul the jewel company came to their high school and did a presentation so i'll sum it up for you essentially they kicked all the teachers out so they could have a safe space so it was just the students and the jewel rep who was repeatedly telling them that a jewel is completely safe it's totally safe but we don't want you to use it because you're young um, and then when one of the two of the students approached these two who testified and came up to the jewel rep afterward and said hey you know what do i do if my friend's addicted to nicotine they asked the jewel guy and uh Apparently, the rep thought that they were talking about cigarettes and told the young man, oh, well, if he's if he is, then he should switch to Juul. So it's very clear kind of what the ethics and morals of some of these companies are and the fact that they are engaging in quote unquote prevention programming with young people is very concerning. If you look at what Juul in particular has done um, with their marketing as they've gotten into more trouble and been sued by more people, uh, they really pivoted early on. Uh, their ads were very youth focused and very uh, high energy uh, and using a very different brand than what you would see nowadays. Uh, they recently actually ceased all advertising again, not just out of goodwill, but because of litigation. I want to just emphasize that. But before they did, if you had seen Juul ads on the internet, on TV or in the newspaper, they probably looked a lot like the one on the right, where they're focusing in on um, middle aged uh, folks who were using this to quit smoking and telling their stories in a very positive way. If you click this, it'll take you to a New York Times and Stanford article about how that pivot happened and giving really great examples of that. Unfortunately, as one of the side effects of cracking down really hard on Juul and the fact that their model of nicotine salt has been so successful is the proliferation of a parade of imitators. And so this is just one sampling of the just flash drive style pod-based um, e-cigarettes using nicotine salt. You may recognize some of these in your work with students and on school campuses or in the community, uh, just a small sampling of what is out there. And so the danger then becomes if we over emphasize cracking down on Juul themselves and not the entire industry, we're missing an opportunity because um, the young people pivot to whatever is available to them. So as Juul, we came under more scrutiny, they would pull their flavors and they would go find other brands of flavors. Um, and then uh, I'm just gonna give you an example here. Views Alto, if you haven't seen this one, this is from our friends at RJ Reynolds, um, another tobacco company. And you can see that selling their device for just 99 cents, right? We know that young people are very price sensitive when it comes to substance use, meaning that as prices go up, a lot of the, their use goes down. And conversely, when you make something very cheap and available, youth use goes up. So again, the pods are sold separately, right? It's just the Gillette model of get them, get them in the door and then keep them buying. So you may seen, you may have seen in the news some of this hubbub about the FDA and what they're doing around regulation um, and ban flavor bans, all kinds of stuff, uh, which really started back in September is when this conversation about the flavor ban uh, came into play with the White House. And they had said, we're gonna pull all the flavored e cigs off the market. Uh, we, we need to keep this away from young people. Unfortunately, uh, the final result of all of those talks and negotiations that involved the White House and then industry representatives was that they backed off of what they were initially going to do and said, we're going to look only at the pods, the flavored cartridges and um, not, uh, yeah, so, not the other tank based systems which again seems seems logical on the surface but remember if we're talking about where where the market is flourishing right now especially here in california 
it's not necessarily just the pods, it's the refillable Nix salt pods. And so if we're not addressing those, you can still get sweet flavored liquids. Um, and so access for those is going to be a problem. Uh, and you can again click this if you want more information on what has actually taken place with the enforcement. Uh, just to give you a brief recap of how you know, the FDA status in 2016, they got the power to regulate all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. Um, but they gave a grace period before they would start regulating and enforcing and extended it to 2022. Then in this past fall, they were under a lot of pressure and said, we're going to move that up. And then this is what they did. So this is a partial measure. So still, uh, tobacco, these e-cigarettes are not subject to regulation and submitting for approval to prove that their products are not harmful, that they're not going to hook young people. So they're still delaying on the overall regulation and enforcement of vaping devices. So that's kind of it for the content. I did want to share with you some resources because you're all working with students, families, and communities, and uh, I want you to have some resources at your disposal. So number one is this um, infographic from CDPH. Again, if you click it, it's a PDF, and you can post this up in your office or give to your administrators just on proper handling procedures for e-cigarettes since they're toxic waste, they're hazardous waste. You can't just throw it in the trash can and also uh, should not be handling it with bare hands whenever possible since nicotine can be uh, absorbed into the skin and there may be other unknown toxins in the liquids. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the research articles and some of the citations that are in these slides, um, these are great resources. So the two NASM reports, uh, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, both on e-cigarettes and cannabis over on the left and right, and then the Surgeon General report in the middle. Again, you can click these to get direct access. Uh, particularly relevant uh, for all of you who are working in health is these three landing pages from CDPH, the CDC, and the FDA with uh, recommendations, updates. You can see how many cases have emerged in California, for example, um, of these illnesses with particular guidelines for healthcare practitioners uh, from all three different agencies. And they do have, I know they look very similar, but they actually do have differences in their recommendations. Um, to an extent and their conclusions about what is happening with this epidemic. If you are doing direct education work with students, I just wanted to quickly plug a few resources. So the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit has really comprehensive information, uh, PowerPoints, uh, lesson plans, cahoots, different activities that you can do with young people. Um, they actually also just released their uh, Brighter Futures, I believe is the name of the curriculum, which is intended as an alternative to suspension and is sort of a hybrid of a brief intervention with motivational interviewing um, along with some e-cigarette information. Catch My Breath is a grade six through nine, four session curriculum specifically on vaping and e-cigarettes, again, completely free, just like the Stanford kit. And then Scholastic Heads Up um, also has a number of lesson plans and just released their um, uh, the real cost. So if you look up Scholastic Real Cost, I forgot I didn't put it in here for some reason. Um, they did partner with the FDA to put together a vaping specific curriculum as well, completely free of charge. For intervention and cessation, so the American Lung Association has put together a couple of great curricula on intervention and cessation called In Depth and Not on Tobacco, both of which have been. Uh, specifically tailored to address youth vaping. And then the California Smokers Helpline has been in ex existence for a while, but they've expanded to, again, focus more on vaping and provide a texting support as well. And then down at the bottom, this is quitting. So this is from the Truth Initiative. You may have seen their, um, their advertisements on TV as well, their anti-tobacco advertisements. They have launched a texting support service for 13 to 24-year-olds who are trying to quit vaping specifically. So if they text text ditch jewel to 88709, then they can get some text message coaching on how to quit tips from other young people um, who have found success in quitting and curbing their cravings. Uh, and it's really just a nice support system for youth because as we know, um, part of their developmentally, they do want to do things on their own, they may be more reluctant to seek physical help and sit down with the counselor. Um, and they may not want to actually speak on the telephone uh, with a phone counselor. And so this is just offering another supplement to that to help young people in a kind of an innovative way. 
If you're looking for parent resources, a great first stop is the Surgeon General's Know the Risks website, which has a number of uh, PDFs and resources, videos, um, bilingual English, Spanish, uh, about e-cigarettes and how to talk to your kids about vaping. And then drugfree.org down below also has a number of great resources on vaping, marijuana, and many other drugs that we didn't even talk about today. Uh, particularly, I want to note in their parent resource library, they have a couple ebooks on intervention and treatment. And um, for instance, when you're trying to find substance use treatment for your child, what are some of the things you should be looking for in a treatment center? What are some of the questions you should be asking? So really great um, community of support at drugfree.org. For marijuana specifically, cannabis, uh, let's talk cannabis from the California Department of Public Health have, again, a number of videos and one-pagers in English-Spanish uh, to explain, you know, what are the actual laws about marijuana, what's legal, what's not, different legal penalties for different ages, um, what about uh, marijuana and pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, again, a ton of resources, so check that out. And then the Marijuana Fact Check is another great resource where if you click these little icons down here, for example, like on IQ, it'll give you just a few uh, key points. Um, it'll summarize the research for you in a couple sentences, a great shareable resource for parents. Also in these slides, I've just included here a list of articles that you can check out if you're curious, things about like CBD. Um, so, oh, this one from UCSF is a great article talking about the the folks who manufacture these artificial flavorings with their safety guidelines saying, please do not inhale this. This is a great, uh, great activity for young people to look at. Um, and Jewel and the way they pivoted, the Kool-Aid Man and Big Tobacco. Uh, so just some nice resources, articles for you to check out if you're interested in learning a bit more. This bit.ly right here, if you go here, will take you to uh, a Google Drive folder. Actually, I just realized I'm sh screen sharing. I'm talking about all these websites. I could just be clicking them. <laughs> if you go to this bit.ly, what you'll see is a Google Drive folder that has a lot of the, re the resources that I talked about just now. Um, and I have them in folders here. And you can uh, just download the PDFs directly. So I know sometimes when you go to these websites, they'll ask you to you know, put your email in, et cetera, et cetera, sign up for our mailing list. So just to make it quick and easy, um, I've assembled those into that Google Drive folder. So you can check that out if you prefer. So now um, I'm going to kick it back over uh, to Amy. Yeah, Stephen, if you want, you can just keep the slides up because I sure. imagine people might want to um, go back to some of those if they have questions about specific resources. But just to start out, thank you so much. That was really in-depth in a really short period of time and in particular a lot of great resources at the end that I think people are going to definitely want to take advantage of. So thank you for consolidating and doing all that work on behalf of everyone so they're all in one place. Um, we do have about nine minutes left, so we have some time for questions. Okay. Um, if folks have questions or comments, um, they can and either enter them into the chat box or the Q&A box, and I'm happy to um, consolidate them and um, present them back to you. Um, we did get a few questions already, so if you want to start answering those while people enter in other ones. Um, there was a question about cost, because I realize you mentioned, I think, the puff, and now I lost my answer. Yeah. Yes, was about $5, and you said that's two usages, but could you give us more sense of the cost of some of the other things? Sure, yeah. So the so the Juul itself, the again, a lot of these, the prices are coming down over time. Not great. Um, but the starter kits are typically about $20. Bucks. Um, again, there's coupons and promos all the time. Uh, just so to recap, a Juul pod's about, about a pack of cigarettes is what they estimate for nicotine. Um, and so for some students, they can make that last a long time. Other times you have 15, 16 year olds saying, oh, I go through one, one or more pods a day, which is worrying in its own right. But you can see how that can get expensive if a four pack of pods is about $20. It's still cheaper than cigarettes, unfortunately. The reality is that these products are actually very affordable for young people, particularly when you buy the refillable ones and buy the bottles of liquid. For example, if you buy a 30 milliliter bottle of nicotine salt liquid and each Juul pod contains only 0.7 milliliters, think about how many Juul pods you can fill up with the liquid for 10 bucks. Um, wow. And the uh, the puff bars are also very cheap, five, six bucks, and those contain about two Juul pods worth of nicotine. So think about that. Um, and you know they're they're continuing to sort of lower the prices on a lot of these things, unfortunately, which makes them very accessible. Thank you. I think that explains that well. 
Um, another question we got is the whether or not, and I'm trying to rephrase, sorry, you can put nicotine in some of the pods and cannabis um, liquid and others, but can you combine them or are they interchangeable? Could you swap the liquid? Sure, that's a great question. So when you're talking about um, the different devices, and I'll back up all the way to uh, just the photos here so we can take a look. Um, all of these things ultimately uh, are interchangeable to an extent. So uh, folks, they do make Juul pods specifically. With, they're not official Juul branded, but you can buy pods that are compatible with this battery device that contain marijuana liquids. Um, in the cartridges, in, sometimes they're not all packaged like this, but you could combine nicotine with the cannabis concentrates. You especially can combine flavors into any of these. So you can have a flavored marijuana cartridge that doesn't smell like marijuana. It may smell like grapes, for instance. Um, and you can, unfortunately, you kind of interchange for some of these things what you're vaping in, in there. And it's very difficult to tell. Uh, there are now some testing strips, which, again, I can't vouch for, but my law enforcement partners are using uh, that can detect the presence of THC in the liquid. So they actually have to swab it to check because the smell is not reliable and there's so much mixing and matching. Um, so ultimately, yeah, it's difficult to tell what is in the device and you really have to be looking for signs of marijuana impairment, honestly, to tell if someone's been vaping marijuana. Wow, okay, that's good to know. Um, I have one more question for you, but then I also realize that because you're currently the presenter, you might have be able to see other questions than I can see. So oh. just maybe double check your screen. Um, one other question that I saw is that someone asked what a wax pen is. is sure. A different <laughs> so, yeah, so this terminology is kind of interchangeable. So people will, uh, the cannabis concentrate, it's an oil, and there's a nut, there are other sort of textures and shapes, and sometimes uh, it's more waxy, or it's like, um, another one is called shatter, which is uh, very similar, but has kind of a harder, hard candy consistency. And... Um, so the many people in the olden days, the olden days, in the early days of vaping marijuana, it was very DIY. So in, in your vaping pen, you would t typically use one of these style of devices or these, and you would, it would be very DIY and you kind of just smear the wax into onto the coil, onto the heating element, and then hit the button and heat it up. And that's how you would vape uh, the concentrate. But as the oils and everything started to get more sophisticated, that has become uh, less common. But still, people use that terminology interchangeably. They'll say, oh, I confiscated a wax pen from the student. Or uh -huh. so it, even though it may not actually look like wax, um, it's typically the oil that they're using, especially now, um, it's mm -hmm. very, it's interchangeable. So there's still the same concentrates. There's still typically the same ranges of THC in them. Uh, it's just that terminology has stayed, has stuck around, no pun intended. <laughs> Um, great. Well, those are all the questions that I received. I don't know if you see okay. any others on your WebEx account, but uh, I did not. I'm. I think I'm in the right Q and A over here. Okay. But um, yeah. I, well, oh, perfect. unless they posted oh, in yeah. the chat, I didn't look. Okay. No, I think we're okay. Then then I think that's everything. Well, I'll just say again that we're going to post both the slides and the recording on our website. And um, we will actually try to tease out all of those resources and put those individual links on the website as well so Great. that it's easier for people to click on them. Um, and I know you're available for follow-up questions. Um, we're available for follow-up questions. We're also always happy to bring you back to do follow-up presentations if people want to dive more deeply into any of those different um, directions, you know, sort of how to do education, how to do clinical intervention, cessation. Um, so definitely folks should feel free to reach out to either or both of us about further information that they might need. Um, we will also definitely be discussing vaping and um, both marijuana and tobacco use at a conference in May. So again, look out for that registration link. Um, and thank you, huge thank you again to all of you for joining us and especially to Stephen for all of your expertise and for your time today. So thank you so much. Alrighty, take care. Okay, take care everyone. Everybody.